I was uh, I was very struck uh, when looking at these these two stories again in Star and uh, um, looking at Cthulhu in particular yeah. how uh, both these stories are really global stories. Uh, going back to what you what you said about the, the point of view in Cthulhu, we go we journey through uh, Rhode Island, Louisiana, Greenland, mountains of China, New Zealand, Norway, uh, and Pacific mm. in one fairly fairly shortish short story and uh, in the star you have this roving sort of camera <coughs> point of view that looks at a woman who's uh, 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 grieving and mourning the, um, uh, the loss of a, a child as a, um, a, a homeless uh, person wandering through uh, the snow it covers all of Europe and then obviously it covers the entire planet and it goes, it goes to South America and it's, it's a huge global sweep uh, for uh, for a, a very short story, um, it, are, are these the first writers to do this? It's, it's very cinematic, uh, and it, it makes me think of, you know, uh, it's, it's a common cliche in um, sort of disaster movies where you see, uh, you know, the film set in America, and then you see the Big Bang and the same sort of disaster happening in the background, and then the events of Egypt, and see the same disaster in the background. And in the trailers of the new Independence Day, they even sort of make fun of that, and there's a line, um, I think it's Jeff Goldblum says, don't always go for the landmarks. <laughs> <laughs> is, this, is, this a, is this something which came about at the time? Because it's, it predates cinema. Yeah. Um, well, I think, uh, 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 maybe with my kind of area of expertise, can you all hear me okay with this? Yeah. Uh, Verne did some of that. Yeah. From the Earth's and and so on. But, uh, but when Wells certainly went uh, to town on it, and it was very cinematic, as you said. He was very aware of the uh, early experiments in cinema. Um, and you can see it in the War of the Worlds, where he kind of pans back, and you look down on London. Sometimes he just justified it, justifies it as a, a balloon is over London that day, where it the crowds splashes with the black smoke from the Martians have been <coughs> So he does use that very visual technique. Uh, later, uh, there's a book called Mr. Brittling Sees It Through, which is not a very good book, very different. It's, uh, it's, it's Wells as a 50-year-old in the middle of World War I. Um, and uh, he's a fictitious father in the book, and he's describing uh, his reaction to the, to the war and the horror. At first, he's all for it for smashing the horror of Germany. Then he's the waste of war and the love of the youth and so on. Very traumatized. But in the middle of that, he talks about the use of very cinematic techniques. There's one where it's, it's early, just as the war's breaking out, it's a sort of August day, I think, or, uh, there's, a, there's a, a county fair, there's children on married around and things. And then he said it's as if uh, uh, newspaper headlines were burning through this image um, of, of troop movements in France and this kind of thing. Um, and it is all basically. So he was, he was maybe describing early experiments as against his piece of uh, yeah, so, but certainly that sort of roving eye point of view of the cinema it must, must have really brought in the meditation of the Because the Dickens does it a little bit as well. In, um, oh, uh, that's a little bit of uh, Yeah, Dick, Dickens does it in um, uh, Christmas <coughs> Carol, where the ghost goes over the person. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's an aspect to our policy to H.P. Lovecraft's uh, writing, which is kind of perhaps unique to him. And he's, he's always... Uh, Fascinating is kind of bringing disciplines back together, and as uh, in Cthulhu, I mean uh, the, the opening the opening paragraph sort of reads uh, just to quote a couple of bits. But the most merciful thing in the world, I think, is the inability of the human mind to correlate its contents. Uh, dot dot dot. Some day, uh, the, the piecing to di together dis uh, dissociated knowledge will open up such terrifying vistas of reality and of, uh, of our frightful position therein that we will. Uh, we shall enter. We shall either go mad uh, from the revelation or flee from the deadly light uh, uh, into the peace and safety of the new dark age. He's fascinated with bringing together, piecing together, as he says, uh, dissociated knowledge. And he, he does this not only with regard to science fiction and horror as genres he's bringing them together, but within these stories he'll cover psychology, geology, he loves, he loves good earthquake, astronomy. So the earthquakes are always connected to space and as it is in uh, the stars, I'm not entirely sure how those two things always relate. There's always an earthquake whenever or some volcanoes explode whenever the star comes in. Um, anthropology, 
he, he's, he's kind of like a massive, he's remixing these disciplines. And I wonder, Ramsey, if somebody who's known and worked under his influence for many, many years, if you think he's, is he kind of an Elizabethan intellect that's slightly uh, out of, out of his time, oh, very much or, so. or is he is, is he kind of like uh, ahead of his time because uh, now so much science is kind of uh, interdisciplinary. It's, it's it's breaking the boundaries of question. No, I, I've got a couple of say it was both actually. It, it, it seems to me it, it, in one sense he, he certainly regarded himself as being you know, a man. Of, uh, he was much preferred to the um, well, more than a century earlier actually. It was, it, that, was, that was his preferred period. But, but equally, no, he, he was he was he was. Very forward-looking in the sense that he, he, he would embrace uh, well the latest scientific discoveries. Of course, not, but not always. Sadly, uh, that that sound you know that some have been discovered since. So certainly, you know, some of the eugenics that that uh, surfaced in his work. But to some extent, well, the eugenicists too, you know, obviously. Um, but at that time, you know, they they were they were considered to be the you know the the the. the um, well, that wasn't the, not the last word, so the latest thing. Uh, but no, that's what we're, we're trying to take new discoveries and, and build upon them. So he was certainly looking both forwards and backwards without doubt. And he certainly did draw upon particular structures of what he saw in the field. So, you know, something like the, the call of cuckoo, you know, like, uh, <laughs> or however you want to do it. Um, you know, it, it certainly derives to some extent from Stoker's Dracula. I mean, you know, the use of documents and also Arthur Macker, the great god of Pan. Uh, but I think Lovecraft refined the process um, beyond what either of the writer has done. And that's the, the documentary sort of element. Yeah, the uh, use it, of documents. It's, it's so influential, again, in film. It feels like Hollywood mm. disaster films or, or mm. film generally, the horror films, and of, of all different types, are still digesting these, these techniques. Which both both Wells in terms of the point of view and uh, Lovecraft in terms of the sort of documentary uh, style, is it, the cinema is still digesting them and still sort of affecting them, as you say with uh, Blair Witch Project. Um, just talking about this, the question of the role of science, uh, Stephen, going back to H.G. Wells, there's, there's sort of two interpretations of Wells. One, a lot of biographers talk about his. His, uh, his grounding in biology, the fact that he wrote lots of science, popular science books himself. He uh, apparently uh, was desperate to be uh, um, entered into the Royal Society, allowed, uh, appointed a member of the Royal Society, which he, he never was. And then there's another reading of Wells, which uh, perhaps uh, popularised by uh, Jules Verne, who said he wasn't really that interested in science. There's a, there's a quote. Uh, essentially, Jules Verne accused him of using um, uh, science as, a, as like a, a new magic or a new fantasy to, to like a just so story to kind of uh, explore his social ideas. You know, whether it's uh, the class system with regard to the time machine, or uh, empire and colonialism with regard to uh, world worlds, or man's hubris, the hubris of science when it comes to um, um, uh, the Island and Doctor Thoreau. Um, Verne said. Um, it occurs to me that, that his Wells stories do not repose on very scientific bases. Uh, no, there is no rapport between his work and mine. I make use of physics he invents. I go to the moon, on in, uh, I go to the moon in a cannonball discharged from a cannon. There is no invention that's you know, possible. Uh, he goes to Mars in an airship which he constructs out of a metal which does away with the law of gravitation. Uh, so I said, Trey look at Jolie, but show me this metal, let's <laughs> introduce it. There's this argument that, uh, and it sometimes applies, I know Jeff Lyman applies it to the kind of the history of science fiction, that there's two schools, the Verne School, which is about real science, hard science, uh, predicting, uh, really engage, predicting what new technology might be able to do, and really engaging with science, and then the Wellesian approach, or what Verne says is the Wellesian approach, which is to use it like a magic wand, uh, or use it as a device to explore other themes. Uh, do you subscribe to that kind of dichotomy? Well, I think it's, you know, the, uh, it, it's, it's never as simple as that, is it? That's, that's the yeah. good answer. Uh, I mean, Verne, for instance, I mentioned off on a comment, there's just another, Hector Serverdak, I think is the original title in French, where a comet lifts the earth magically 
it becomes a kind of spherical blob of part of the Mediterranean. And, and, and like little clouds away, and off they go into the void. And Vern looks at all of the gravity and so forth. You know. The density is somehow magically increased. And when they come back to the Earth, um, I think he originally watched a, a, a huge splat and disaster. His editor was very close to the Earth. No, 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 you've got to look at them off. So they, they, I think they fly up in balloons and just settle down. It's as if not. So Vern was quite capable of. Uh, uh, um, yeah. On the other hand, I mean, yeah, you probably would say in modern times it was more of a hard effort than the ones in terms of sticking to the known. Uh, yeah, from the Earth to the Moon. Yes, I mean, you know, a few details aside, they're getting splattered against the base of the shell, the cannon of the moon, less than was anti gravity. Um, and Fern didn't show any life in the moon the way it worked well as it did. You wouldn't speculate that far. Maybe you shouldn't trace the vegetation quite a number, but not, nothing spectacular. Um, but, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but, I, but I would say Wells, uh, it, well, this isn't fair to say either, really. Wells went deep, I think, I think the lesson of science went deep into Wells as a great man. Because he studied under Huxley, who was Darwin's bulldog. So he was the generation after the evolutionists, you know. He was the first to be taught in evolution at college. And um, so this bleak, dark, mechanistic view of the universe um, absolutely convinced him. He rejected religion on the other hand. He was, he was kind of forcibly confirmed at one point. He had to get a confirmation to, to be able to teach at some school or other, which he deeply resented. And he had to study religion or uh, you know, Christianity to, to do this. He called it rafts of rotting ideas and so on. Um, so I think the basic message of science, that there's a scientific explanation of rationality of the universe for ourselves, was deeply embedded in him. With all this gruesome side, you know, I mean, really, the, um, uh, the war of the worlds, the clash of biospheres, uh, um, in, in a very basic and fundamental way, the bacteria, which have been killing us for a billion years, which is why they kill the Martians quicker. You know, it's, we still kill this. You know, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a gruesome uh, uh, tale. I think he says that Dr. Moreau, which got criticised for its horror, horrific aspects at the time, he said every time the universe, every so often the universe turns to him with a particularly gruesome grimace, because he sees the really dark side of, 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 of life. So I think for all the antiquity and, uh, and so forth, um, I think he got the underlying spirit of, of, of the time, this late Victorian age when they were having to shed, really, the relatively comforting illusion that we are creatures of a God, and this awful, really empty, conceivably, um, idea that we are like machines, really, you know, uh, um, zombies who have risen from the dirt. And he, 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 I think at a very deep level he got that, so, you know, I mean, there was a great deal of to between the world and well, so you can't put that aside. It's kind of, it's, that's a bit like reading out commentaries by Nevin um, and of the Liverpool <laughs> European country in 1985. You know, you're not going to get much people to do. When you talk about the, the war, uh, the war worlds, and the, the war's biospace, it reminds me of Darwin's phrase, you know, the quiet war, which is the quiet mm -hmm. war, which uh, nature fights all the time. Um, Sorry, I've been hogging the questions for the first so many. Uh, I want to throw it out to you guys. I can keep asking questions all night, uh, but. Uh, I'm sure you guys want to, to ask some questions. Andy. So, I, thank you. I, I do apologise. I'm going to have to shoot off right up to it. But I want to just to um, follow up on what uh, Steve said about the last question. That, um, in um, uh, introducing a collective uh, works in scientific romances in 1936, well, is it, it's desperate to sort of say, I don't do science. I'm trying to get the same. Uh, plausibility is a gripping dream, and, uh, and, 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 and he goes back to um, sort of Greek romances, and, uh, and, and but he also significantly gets the entire idea of Frankenstein wrong, um, and it, 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 it's sort of clear that if you were to ask questions in well, he was actually writing the scientific romances, he would be much more scientific. And also, I don't think with Wells is this. Uh, the world's, world's in scholarship will never end, will it? Because he wrote so much, he used so much every day of his other life, probably, that no one scholar could ever grasp the whole. And he contradicted himself. 
So that, as you say, when he was producing uh, editions of the <coughs> scientific romances in the 20s and the 30s, he could be quite dismissive. You know, he was, he was on the other side of the barrier from the romance of the world. He became much more didactic. He was writing these utopias, you know, trying to make specific political points and so forth, um, uh, at, which were probably more, more uh, well argued as uh, straightforward polemics, but much less gripping as fiction. Another big complication, with, so he was looking back with rather jaundiced eye about his own work. Um, however, but another thing around the world, of course, was uh, his own physical state. You know, there he is in 1895, 6, 7, when he wrote The War of the Worlds and The Time Machine. Great success, but at the time, he seemed to be under a sentence of mortality. Uh, he had, it was a TB, he was a of um, He'd been badly injured in a football match. Um, when he was a teacher, briefly, he got kicked in the kidneys by some lad, <laughs> um, which, which, which it, it, in the Legion of Um And it looked as if his life expectancy, and his health was pretty poor, it looked as if his life expectancy was going to be pretty short, even while, you know, his personal success was booming. I mean, you know, he must have been a terrible, such a young man, was in a terrible uh, dichotomy of impressions, writing very quickly to get it all out. And that surely coloured the early scientific romances, you know, Dr. Moreau and so on. You, you really was seeing the very dark side of the universe because he thought, you know, the universe was being very harsh on him. So it's not much of a surprise that he gets it kind of all clear by 1900 or so. And then, you know, his mind's clarified and he starts telling us all why well, eugenics is a good thing. <laughs> about um, the short stories as form. Why do you think the short story particularly suits as uh, science fiction and horror writing? Or do you think it particularly suits it at all? Or um, how it informs your... Well, actually, I, I, I think they do different things. I think the novels are important for the short story and the horror story and the horror fiction uh, field these days. I, mean, I think that the, it, the, the novel has developed very considerably since, I suppose, I must say there's early great examples of it from Frankenstein on the lot, maybe you know, to claim Frankenstein for science fiction, I think most people do. Frankenstein on the certainly does, that's true, yeah. Well, I think we can, we can each, each of us have a part of it, maybe, you know, <laughs> yeah. a state of it. Um, <laughs> you want one each. Of exactly, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, you know, so Dracula and the Haunting of Hill House, and so forth, uh, I am legend. Um, but you know, from, I think really from the 70s on, I mean, there was, well, imagine the, the modern golden age of horror, the novel developed very considerably, um, all of a sudden, really. Uh, and yet, you know, some of the greatest work in the field is even the short story, because you know, it's very compact. You can, you know, in the most poetic way possible, you, you can organize everything to a single effect. Whereas the novel is, I think, much more discursive in its effect. But you see, I, I, for myself, I like that. I actually like the fact that a novel will gain its own energy and momentum um, in ways that a short story, you know, pretty by, by definition cannot. But of course, we also have the novella in the middle. And it, it's often argued that that is the perfect form for horror fiction, you know, certainly some of the, well, obviously, that's the, the ones I was quoting earlier, the white people, the willows, the Whisper in Darkness, most of Lovecraft's latest stories uh, on the those, Ted Klein, very fine American contemporary writer, um, so like Steve King's The Mist, you know. Um, and so it's not, it's, not it's, 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 it's a specific form, and usually, I mean, keep coming back to Brown Waters this evening, I mean, I, I remember his argument that a novella should take place within a very short space of time, really. So you have that sort of unity. You can still be saying time, but my voice don't go back. Uh, um, so, quite honestly, I wouldn't argue in favour of one over the other. I think that they, they have their merits, I wouldn't be that either, and certainly not to write on myself. No, no, and I think about that for science fiction. There are, there are people who say that short fiction, short story, maybe the Nevada is perfect form for science fiction because of the plausibility thing. You, know, you get away with an outrageous sort of idea for 10 pages before the reader starts sinking. And the time machine is the novella length, I would say, 100 pages in yeah. that edition. Um, but yeah, but, but I, you know, yeah, I've done pretty short stories, but my, my preferred length is the novel or the, the novel series when you really explore 
an idea. Ideally, from one change, you know, uh, in, in, in the universe as we know it, maybe with props like spacecraft or whatever, but one big change, one new idea, and then really explore it and see how it, um, how it, how it works out. Um, but uh, the, the star is a really, really good example of how you can quickly fly around this roving, roving camera. You can see lots and lots of people's different lives. You can just see it in a glimpse. You get, uh, you get right into a character and then straight out again. And the mathematician, I guess it's probably, um, he's, he somehow becomes the centre of that story. And you see him so little. You see him uh, make the first observation. You see him in a couple of lectures. Um, you have this moment where he sort of devastates his, his uh, students with this, uh, with this fantastic line, um, humanity has been in vain or something, you know, yeah. it's and his kids look up and you know, this, is, this isn't usual, this isn't a normal lecture. You get into those, uh, those worlds and those lines really, really, really quickly and you don't, in a way it's kind of, I personally think it's, a, it, it's sort of a more pure form of the Roman camera because you don't stick with anybody. And there's a great, there's a great argument about um, world building, and uh, we can talk about world building with Dr. Uh, HP, um, but there's, uh, there's a line by Ken John Harrison about the fact that you can build the world with a single sentence. And H.G. Wells, in that story, just drops into a line and builds a line in a single sentence and then moves on. Um, and it's, I think it's masterful. <laughs> Yeah, I, yeah, I, I don't quite agree about that. No. I, think, I think that's a special case. As I said, I think it's a relic of a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a novel that was never written. Hence, you know, there's so much detail that's kind of crammed in because that's what we're reading in a novel. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I suspect that's just my theory of that. And you can see how in, in the one world's collide. I mean, my, I went to about how that, it may have been related to the story. As I recall it, um, the... Actually, I think, I think it's in the essay, this, this stuff. Uh, this, one of the script writers on One Worlds Collide had worked on Wells' properties, the Invisible Man or something. So he clearly knew all about Wells. But, but, but the story wasn't credited in the movie. Even though you have the same kind of got the global viewpoints, mm. and particularly there is a, a kind of master mathematician yeah. uh, element in the movie, except it's a, it's a differential analyzing in that movie which is a kind of Meccano version, uh, 1950s computer. It's all, it's, all, it's all wiggling pens and clattering levers. That is a fantastic thing in the, in the, in the movie. That's replaced the master, 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 master um, So I think that's a special case, but it, it is a great story. Yep. Um, about 90 years ago, Ghosts, kind of ghost rats lead me to the cellar, I eat my neighbour, I go mad. Yes. And then, or uh, a ghost opens up the tomb, I go in, do whatever, I go mad. And then, <laughs> towards the end, there's a thing that the science fiction has come to the fore. Yeah. And you've got, oh, well, brain in the can, talking spacecrafts. Ah, I went off. I go back to my job as a lecturer in the university. <laughs> <laughs> I just found out that the field is real, the race from the sea. Oh my goodness, ah, I go back to being uh, an archaeologist or whatever. And um, or time travel, I go back to being a lecturer. It kind of humanises. Mm. So, so the, the science fiction always kind of humanise the protagonists. Okay. But it's towards the end of the, the things. I think that's. Uh, Point yes, I think so. Yes, I, 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 I take your point. Although I suppose usually at the end of those stories, there's still a hint that you know all is not well, and that you know the narration of the call is is um, it, it sounds like you know he, he, he's he's um, not long for this world because he knows too much basically. Yeah. Um, so the lecturer in in the shadow out of time is you're thinking oh, I'm sure the, yeah. that great time travel story. Lovecraft, I suppose that's Lovecraft. Versus the time machine, really, where you know your your mind is actually then projected into the future, or well, basically not into the into the past. I'm sorry, let me get that right. Um, I won't ruin the story if anybody's not read it. But it does have one of those just um, most striking, um, confirmatory images at the very end of the story. Um, but have you really survived? And, and I, 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 I want to take your point. Usually, the stories don't end on that note, do they? There's, there may be a sense earlier on in the story that this character has to some extent got it back together, you know, as much as he possibly can. Um, 
but the, the story is pretty well always ended on the note of, of um, you know, the final revelation and, you know, kind of mental devastation, if you like. Well, in the case of Shadow over Intel, of course, you know, they, they, they discovered that you yourself are what, what you thought was, was profoundly alien. Um, and that sort of ends on, that does end on very ambiguous terms of what you might see as affirmation, I think. Um, it depends on how you read it. Uh, you know, it's either helpless as an apartment maybe, unless you know, he's going to swim off to this, this place under the sea. Um, but I think I didn't do that. I've always felt that, that, that that's the one story of Love Jobs that really merges one thing that I didn't talk about at all, because we didn't cover everything, but you know, the, as well as the science fiction and the horror. Love Jobs read a fair amount of high fantasy. Um, Things like the Dream Festival of the Kajaf and the Silver Key and so forth, um, largely influenced by Lord Dunsany. But the, the end of the, the, the Shadow of Rizla almost feels that it has turned from being a horror story into a kind of almost lyrical fantasy. And it's certainly very ambiguous, but I think, so it's there. So I suppose there's this, there's this, I suppose there's this the ambiguous tendency is, is what I'm now beginning to, uh, to, 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 to see. Um, most often reflected in Lovecraft's later work. It's also, to a certain extent, like uh, Poe's influence may be waning, because Poe has that, uh, that sort of um, that motif of the story starting with somebody who is sort of recovering but, or, or failing to recover, yes. they're trying to recuperate and maybe hours from death and then recollecting the whole story in a sort of mm -hmm. a delirium. Mm -hmm. uh, which uh, Lovecraft uses quite a lot in the early stories. He does, yeah, that's right. In fact, you can argue that you know, the, 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 there are lots of correspondences between the rats and the walls of the fourth house of Usher, I think, particularly the, the sense of the house being also, you know, the ancestry of the house in, in that sense. That certainly occurs in, in the world. Uh, you said you'd, uh, about a story that you've written. Yeah. You shouldn't have done it. Yes. <laughs> uh, okay, I've done, I've done this often enough, so I hope the people here have not heard me do it, or who, if they have heard me do it, will probably now want to go and leave rapidly before it's done. Um, what this was, you see, this was, gosh, I was 14, 14 years old, I think, when I began, I guess I was, 14 when I began imitating Love Club. Initially, just for my own amusement, because I'd I, I become absolutely enamoured with his work. I read the first ever British paperback of Lovecraft. It was published here in 1960. And I read it from cover to cover in a day. Uh, you know, I'd already been imitated otherwise, but I know this is my focus. This is what I wanted to do. And as I said, you know, it's very easy to imitate um, what you perceive as Lovecraft, which is the, you know, the, 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 the key adjective like you know, eldritch and unspeakable and so forth. And um, perhaps I need to cover the microphone because I get pretty loud doing this one. Uh, what this is, is it's one of my earliest stories. And August Derleth, who was Lovecraft's publisher, uh, ran Arkham House in America, and who also published my first book, uh, was my first editor. I was very lucky indeed at the age of 15 to get an editor who would tell me what to do and what not to do, or particularly. So, without further ado, this is one of the things you tell me not to do, and you will, you will understand that. It's many of the things all, all wrapped into one package you tell me not to do, you'll understand why when I do it. Uh, so I think I will cover this, otherwise <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just blow out the microphone or blow out the speakers. Um, this, this was a telegram sent to the narrator of an early story of mine called The Tomb Herd. It was actually set in Lovecraft territory. I don't know if further than Southport, actually. My <laughs> government show, you know. Um, so it's King's Spot in this story. I revised it later and became somewhere else in Britain. Anyway, um, the, the narrator comes upon a telegram that has been, that the, the friend he is visiting has written. The friend has now disappeared, for reasons that will be apparent. Um, and he's left this, you know, the, the pen trails off across the page, so the telegram was never sent. And the telegram, I think I can tell you this verbatim, goes like so. To Richard Dexter, this is, remember this is a telegram, to Richard Dexter, come at once to Kingsport. You are needed urgently 
by me here as protection against agencies which may kill me or worse <laughs> if you do not come immediately. We'll explain as soon as you get here, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> But what is this that flops unspeakably down the corridor towards this room? It cannot be that abomination that I glimpse in the dripping vaults beneath the church in Asquith Place. He had shoved in your to the town! <laughs> We know the whole person to the Wow. Pulling into Liverpool Station, looking up at the great big wet, damp, uh, <laughs> sandstone sides, you know, which are covered in moss. Oh, well. That's very, very look up again. Oh, well, I do that. Picks on the pool. Yes, I, I use those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A later novel, but I've got quite an overwritten, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? I was not that rescued from obscurity. It wasn't appreciated. And That's an interesting question. Well, okay, it was a gradual process. Initially, it was Arkham, Walter Sterling, and John Wanfer, which were his correspondents. Um, and on the day of Durford and Lovecraft's death, Lovecraft was in Providence, uh, Durford, Wisconsin. Um, Durford basically went out and you know, sat on the railway bridge or you know, sat by the, the river, you know. And, and try to think how they, they should commemorate Lovecraft. Dirt was already published as a mainstream by um, Simon and Schuster, and they've been stripped as one of the two in, anyway, in New York. And he initially put together, he and Montreux initially put together this huge fat volume of the best of Lovecraft called The Outsider and Others. Um, offered it to Dirt's office, who said, well, basically, you know, this is, we can't hand the it's a big short story collected by a writer that almost nobody's ever heard of. Um, and so uh, Dell thought, okay, well, we will, we will create a publisher in order to publish it. So it's one of the very first examples of the small press that's become so important in this field. I mean, Archibald was for many, many years the, the leading publisher in the field, suddenly now pretty well defunct. Um, so that, that came out, did not do very well, sold a few hundred copies. Um, it, in, in his lifetime, I've covered it hardly ever been anthologized, although actually Dashiell Hammett, he of the Maltese Falcon, did do one horror anthology in the mid-30s, he used one more dark story. Um, but then, a, a couple of American paperback editions appeared, um, there was uh, a, 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 a mainstream book called Best of the Natural, was it the Best of the Natural Stories of H.P. Lovecraft? Something like that, um, in the mid-40s. Gonax, who over uh, here are still, still saying the good old yellow back yes. Gonax, um, the man that did the, the t this edition of the Time Machine, they picked up Lovecraft in the <laughs> early 50s. But still, it was, a, it was a very slow process. It probably wasn't until the 70s that Lovecraft surfaced in, in, in paperback, but by now there was a certain amount of criticism, largely in the the small press and the fan press, but people were beginning to look critically at his work and you know, write actual exegeses of his work. Um, Colin Wilson actually did a, well, a contentious piece in The Strength to Dream, his, his study of the imag imagination and literature. And the, he was never supposed to do a Lovecraftian book to prove he could do it, but I was the earth, actually. Um, and I, very gradually, I suppose, I didn't really say very much about the Lovecraft mythos, which is like this enormous uh, top heavy thing. Lovecraft only ever put it together in a, in a, a deliberately allusive way, an elusive way, actually, you know, in the sense it was always meant to imply and suggest more than ever showed. Um, then lots of them, not least me, God help me, you know, came along and sort of filling in the gaps of exactly what not to do, you know, and, and explain far too much. Um, and then, you know, the, I suppose, the, the, the whole explosion of horror fiction and fantasy in the, in the post-Tolkien, or, or not post-Tolkien, but the Tolkien, Stephen King here, which came slightly later, um, also lots of people wanted to, to publish Lovecraft. And 
more recently, you know, we have the Penguin Modern Classics Edition uh, with you know, a corrected text with footnotes. We have um, the Library of America did an edition of Lovecraft. And, and also, we have to say, of course, the, the cinema picture initially in the early 60s, Roger Corman made The Haunted Palace, which is based on Lovecraft. And then after that, well, a few years later, actually, uh, films with Lovecraft's name above the title, or at least on the poster, started to appear. And there was a whole Lovecraft film industry that's now, now the most of which is pretty really terrible. There are a few very good ones. Um, but, you know, he, and he became critically accepted, basically. Um, and also, there's been, you know, a cons very considerable amount of academic writing on him over the past 10 or 15 years, I suppose. And um, so it was, a, it was a very, very gradual process. And he, you know, he went to a bit of almost being forgotten, but well, having been that remembered in the first place. And you know, the word got out, really, as they tend to do. Do you, would you say that when, well, for me, I'm like a second generation of Lovecraft, uh, came in when the role playing game came out in the about eight Well, that, that certainly did, of course. I mean, there's yeah. you know, many, many Lovecraftian role playing games, yes. Because yeah. I remember nobody had heard of it at school. Yeah. Like a week later, everyone yeah. was Lovecraftian. So, ah. like, the English essays were Eldritch. Really? Really? <laughs> <laughs> that cool. yeah. Yeah. But yeah, um, yeah, it's the people that everybody, everybody played. Yes. Wow, yeah. Sure, sure. That's right. That was, that was sort of the third thing about it. I was, I don't know if we have time, but I was going to ask you about the mythos because, mm. um, as you say, he only yeah, sort of suggested it. Why do you think he always had it at the back of his mind? The same universe, the same world building exercise that you can call it? Only very gradually, wasn't it? I mean, when you, when it's only really good to show up in the story about the. The, co the core, I won't pronounce it again. <laughs> uh, previous to that, you know, we have you know, the passing reference to the Necronomicon, which is, you know, this great forbidden book, of which there uh, are you know, half a dozen copies extant, although once people started imitating it, there seemed to be thousands of them, every public library I've got, you know. Uh, uh, um, but it's because, I think, part because he only got to put it together piecemeal, but also, it was, it was only really one of the many symbols he used to suggest you know, the unknown, the, or to be the unknowable, the, 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 the thing that was larger than could actually be shown, not so much that it was unspeakable or indescribable, just too large to be contained within the narrative. Um, and specifically, he was trying to move away from, I've said this on morphology, but I will quote myself here, you know, he was trying to move away from what he saw as the, the excessive um, codification of Victorian occultism, and also, you know, the the standard figures of um, of supernatural literature. I mean, you you did cite the ghost, of course, but there are a few ghosts in Lovecraft. So, I mean, even those are not really conventional ghosts anymore. They are, in, say, M. R. James, where they you know they're very unlikely to be just the returning dead in the usual sense. Um, but I mean, you know, Lovecraft. Well, he just about wrote a vampire story to like the Shunned House. But it most certainly is not any kind of vampire that the, the Carnaby would normally associate with that term. Um, he actually wrote a narrative poem about a werewolf. That was the one really conventional trope he ever employed. But he, he was really he really wanted to invent new things, uh, basically, you know, to engage the imagination <coughs> afresh. Uh, I think that that's you know the the, the, the mythos was he, you know was he, I don't think he ever really did have. Um, a fully developed sense of it. And the, I, I don't think he wanted that either, you know. Although he did encourage his, 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 his literary friends to, um, to add to it, but, but not to explain it. And suddenly when, I think it was really August Berlitz who, um, you know, for all the good that he did as the publisher of Lovecraft, he did, he did very much try and codify it and, you know, uh, organize it in a way that never was actually organized in the first place. It's like Marvel Comics with the uh, mm. like Avengers team ups to try to piece uh, yeah. things together. Yeah, the, 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 all, the, all, all yeah. can be pieced together at all. Yeah. Well, I don't know so much about Marvel, but certainly with Lovecraft. Any other questions? Just going to ask for it. We've got a, a science fiction writer writing about monstrous Martians and a horror writer writing about aliens. Is, how, what's the sort of crossover of the two genres? Mm. Is it, are they kind of exclusive or what? Do we find people kind of pinch, pinch, pinch from each other's kind of area? 
Is there, is there a line? Is there a boundary? Well, uh, well not necessarily a boundary, is there? No, I think it comes from crossovers. It's got to do with the rationale behind the, the, mm. the horror that you see. So the, the world's robot could be called horror of the island of the Moreau. Yeah. And um, a, a particular example. Um, and others as well. So, so, so no, it's, uh, I think it's the rationale beneath that, 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 that counts. Um, I'm surprised that you even questioned Brian Nolan's calling Frankenstein a science fiction book. To me, it's a science fiction book. But do you regard it as a whole, a whole book? More? Um, well, I think that that's a good question, really, as a of origin. You know? I've never been very content with that. When you project mm. one definition of facts in the past, mm. Mm. This, uh, this, I know there's science fiction called scholars, Andy will be able to talk about this, to call proto science fiction, yeah. which, which is more sensible to me. Yeah. It's stuff that led up to what was called science fiction from the last 24 onwards, or whatever, in terms of even worlds of stuff. He called them himself scientific romances. Yeah. So we're romance has got a slightly different, sure. like, tall story kind of aspect. Yes, yes. So, so but, but I think, I, I would say, Frankenstein in that tradition. She was. She seems to be extra extrapolating from um, the, the galvanic experiments and so on. You know, a bit of electricity yeah. and the muscles twitch. So you, you know, that, that's that's a classic bit of that. It is. But that's just for someone who has in, you know, try alchemy and then move beyond it. That's yeah. crucial yeah. detail. So, so it is that in that sense, but only in a retrospective sense. Mm. Uh, uh, but uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, Brian was firmly states that as, as, yeah. as the start of their separate oh, right. There's a whole other tradition that then ignores, which is the travel literature, um, Watson Crusoe, things like that, oh, yeah. Yeah. which uh, which clearly well, feeds into the SF yeah. story. Yeah. But Robinson Crusoe especially, I uh, claim, is a kind of SF story. It's like Martian. Mm. In, in, and that's something like Tropic Paris, mm. but it's, if you think about it at the time, the idea of having a man alone on an island, mm. it was something that could only happen in the age of exploration. Mm. Yeah, it couldn't have happened before because people were sailing around the world to these exotic places. So it's just as if now you have a man standing on Mars alone. Mm. Yeah, it couldn't happen. You know, it, it, it's a situation that arises from, from, from changes of technology and so forth. So, so um, uh, but yeah, I think that's what you're saying. And with uh, um, Forbidden Planet, We've been able to retrospectively project science fiction back all the way to the, to the tempest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. in a way, it's another exploration mm -hmm. uh, Well, my last question, I guess, has to be uh, uh, to Stephen about uh, about the sequel. Am I allowed to ask him? Yes. Do the Do the Martians return? Of course. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> and is it? Uh, can you Can you talk about it at all? Or? Um, well, I, I can, yeah. What approach you've taken? Well, I'm still, I'm still working on it, so I'm always a bit nervous about, you know, who works with this. But I haven't, uh, right from the beginning, uh, it, it's, it's not steampunk, right? And there's no role for Dr. Moreau. And there's no Sherlock Holmes. I've <laughs> 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 been doing that since. That narrows it down. The first sequel to World of War was published as the World of War, it's something pirated in America. They changed all the names to Boston and so on. <laughs> and, and this guy in the sequel of which Edison goes to Mars to lift the mountain. <laughs> as the world there was being. So there's none of that stuff. You know, I, 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 you look at it from my talk, I think it's going to be a piece of work. Uh, uh, you know, it predicted a lot of horrors of the 20th century and, and warfare and, and so on. Um, and um, so you, I think you've got to take it seriously in that regard. What, about 10 years ago or okay, so, I did my own novel of the Civil War Weaver, alternate history of the Nazis in Bay England. Um, and so, you know, researching and reading accounts of the, of the, of the Civil War, first hand accounts, and I kept on coming across as well as name in there. People would keep on saying it's just like something else the Blitz, you know, like something else makes you well, something else makes you well. So, referring to books like War of the Worlds, this, it was important, you know, because somebody at least been there imaginatively mm -hmm. before mm -hmm. and it's the first. So I think, I, I think, you know, a sequel's got to be a, you know, a tribute to that, you've got to take it seriously. Mm -hmm. There are big tanks in it. Fantastic. Well, uh, it just remains for me to uh, thank both of us tonight's guests. Please join me in thanking uh, Steve Parker. <laughs>